Welcome to Comms Business Live. My name is David Dungay, editor and publisher of Archie Visits magazine. Today I have with me Martha D. Mouch, internationally recognised Dell trainer from Ambler. Marcus, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Yourself? So I'm good, enjoying my lockdown experience. It's been good so far. Um, I am looking forward to going outside a little bit more. Uh, I'm not sure about unlimited exercise. Um, I definitely need a haircut. I'm looking forward to getting that one, that one done. You need to do what I do, just lock it off every couple of weeks. <laughs> I, I, I gave up fighting my bald patch. <laughs> I'm not quite there yet. One day, maybe. Um, so, Mark, Marcus, tell us a, a, a little bit about yourself. You know, for, for our audience, you might not know who you are or have come into contact with you previously. Okay, so what I do is I work with founders, CEOs, and sales leaders to achieve massive scale without taking on an army of mediocre salespeople or wasting a fortune on advertising and marketing. And what I've realized over the last 35 years is that more often than not, where scale up technology businesses fall short is lack of vision at the top. And so what I do is I help companies get very clear about where they want to go, why they want to get there and how they're going to get there. And then I work with the leaders and their sales operation in order to ensure um, that we can answer three fundamental questions. How big do you want to get? How soon do you want to get there? And how committed are you to achieving it? And that third one is normally the stumbling block. Sure, okay. I mean, obviously we're in a bit of an unprecedented time at the moment. The state of sales of the panel um, not 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 great for a lot of people. I mean, what what are you seeing um, from your clients and customers? Well, I'm probably going to be very unpopular, but I think this is the best opportunity professional sales organisations and ambitious leaders have or will ever have in their lifetime. Uh, we have an opportunity to rewrite our business from scratch with a blank sheet of paper, and we have a, a great opportunity. Um, to take market share from our competition. The, the reality is that businesses still have to keep running. $5 trillion is going through the global economy every day. So when people are saying no one's buying, what they really mean is no one's buying from me. And there is a huge opportunity for the channel and for vendors who want to expand at scale without the wheels coming off by building a very powerful third party uh, partnership channel, um, especially now that the UK government is talking about two weeks quarantine for anyone stepping in an aluminium tube and flying over. Um, chances are other governments are going to do the same. And who on earth is going to want to give up a month of their life in quarantine um, when they can sell through partners? A partner can hop in a car, nip up the road to see a prospect or a customer 20 minutes, half an hour, and have a meeting. And with the right use of technology, you can help them and support them. So I, I don't subscribe to uh, COVID-19 being anything more than the fabled, mythical summer dip that most organizations are facing. Yes, if you're in hospitality or you're running an airline, it's tough, and I really feel for you. But if you're in any form of SaaS, if you're in for, uh, technology, IoT, uh, AI, robotics, RPA, anything like that, you should be absolutely hammering it. We're seeing a 300% increase in accessibility rates uh, to decision makers. You don't have to phone Zelda Zolotowicz for them to take a heavy breathing call because they're at the end of the alphabet. Now, you know, pretty much anyone's available. And if you're yeah. smart, you can use tools like LinkedIn, you can use tools like Lusher, and the other massive advantage is you can really take advantage of uh, technologies like Refract and Goal, uh, because every single call is now recorded and or recordable. And you can use every single call, every mistake as a learning and a teaching opportunity. I mean, how can you, but you can't possibly hope for something as brilliant as that yeah. ever again in your lifetime. Sure. I mean, a lot of um, channel organisations, they've taken the opportunity to furlough a lot of their sales staff. You know, is that fundamentally a mistake for them? Honestly, I think that's a fabulous opportunity. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Price's Law, Price's Law states that 50% of your productivity will cut and profit 
will come from the square root of the number of people in your organization. So if you have 10 direct salespeople, three of them will produce 50%. If you have a distribution channel of 100 distings, then 10 will produce 50%. If you have 10,000 partners, 100 will produce 50%. And this is 80-20 in the top 20% and also the bottom 20%. So the ones that create most of your pain in terms of late payment, they are unproductive, they're complaining a lot, uh, they're difficult to do business with, definitely use this as an opportunity to just get rid of them. In fact, refer them on to your competition so they can mess up their balance sheet and eat up their resources. <laughs> so we're going to see the, uh, the marketplace flooded with a lot of uh, salespeople, yeah. Yeah. or the kids. Yeah, absolutely. And those are order takers. Those aren't salespeople. They're yeah. zookeepers at best. Um, and they're people who essentially do milk rounds and they take orders. Uh, they don't really sell. But what they do is they turn up and if there's an opportunity there and they have enough food supply to ask, ask for it, um, then maybe they'll be gifted an order. And I don't think that's a bad thing for the profession. Uh, I'm sure I'm going to be deeply unpopular, but I already have a friend. I don't need another. And the reality is that um, it's going to be tough. I mean, this is going to be a bloodbath. We're also seeing at least, I mean, I spoke to Jay McBain for my podcast, and uh, he was saying that of the 600,000 MSPs worldwide, he expects 150 of them to go to the wall. And there's good reason 150, for this. 150,000, a quarter of them will go to the wall. And there's good reason for this. They average no more than eight people. They're owned by a 58 year old who's working 80, 90 hours a week. Um, they have one month's worth of cash reserve, which they'll have come to the end of. They're unable to furlough because if they furlough their good technical people, their big fear is that if they do, then they'll go and find another job or go somewhere safe, um, you know, like a larger organization, or they will you know, go into you know, the public, uh, public sector and uh, they'll never get them back. So as an opportunity to look at um, picking up that type of business where those clients who still are in business still need uh, IT support and they need IT advice and strategy. And I, I think this is really a great opportunity as well to help them rethink how they approach their business because I don't believe in the post-COVID period People are really going to want to go back to spending their time stuck in a sales floor five days a week. People are going to want to work from home. And uh, you found that there's a 20% increase in production during COVID because people are working from home. And this has moved virtualization forward 10 years, but it's all clunky old technology. You know, while these platforms like Zoom and uh, Skype for Business and Teams are great for what they are, they don't really create the user experience that you can have with a physical face-to-face. -face. Now, my suspicion is there will be a massive upsurge in innovation in that area around collaboration, virtualization, uh, remote working. And that, that will represent a fantastic opportunity for Charles. Yeah. I mean, you, you mentioned some of the tools there. Uh, these salespeople are going to have to become a bit more effective with, you know, things like, things like LinkedIn and social media generally. I mean, is this, is this an opportunity for businesses to make sure the service people they do keep are, you know, armed and knowledgeable in these the areas? Yeah. What, what this crisis has done is expose weakness, not create it. So if your pipeline fell off the cliff, chances are a lot of it wasn't real and you are suffering from um, you know, this fictional uh, pipeline syndrome. And um, your salespeople are hanging on to those opportunities or your channel are hanging on to those opportunities because they wanted it to look fat and healthy so they got their mortgage paid for another month. And if you haven't used this uh, down to uh, this lockdown in order to spend a large amount of your time training your people how to actually sell instead of take orders, then that's shame on you. If you're not using this opportunity to teach them how to be effective at prospecting through LinkedIn, 
Well, we did six, seven hundred thousand last year through LinkedIn, and it's me and my wife. Um, you know, I'm part of a much bigger global network, so I can call on other resources. But you know, directly, we generated, I think, it was six hundred and fifty-eight thousand uh, pounds on LinkedIn. Now, um, you can be systematic about how you build pipeline on LinkedIn. It's a fab- fabulous tool, but it's one route to market. You need to learn how to pick up the phone. Like I said. 300% increase in access rates. Um, if you're using technologies like Gong or Refract, you can analyze every single call and identify how your salespeople can improve incrementally. So again, the smarter organizations have been using this as a fabulous opportunity for ca- uh, making themselves leaner, faster, stronger, more effective. Those who haven't are going to come out of this and then they're going to start prospecting and if you've got a 12, 16, 20 week uh, sales cycle, you're going to be starting from scratch. And the smart competition that's been prospecting throughout this period will already be 20 weeks ahead of you. And you, the dust will have settled. You won't even be choking on it. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of businesses are they're waiting for that uh, you know, period two, three months down the line where they, they think we'll all come out and we'll be back to normal. But um, not entirely clear if that's going to happen. You know, off with the fairies. No, oh, completely off with the fairies. We're never going to go back to the way things were. Um, you know, people have grown used to and happy with being able to work from home. And the really good ones have just adapted. I mean, I, I'm not blowing my own trumpet here, but literally when I heard that the lockdown was coming on the Wednesday night, I packed up two bags and moved from my office to my com- very comfortable conservatory. And I've been in here ever since. I've, I, I haven't missed a beat. You know, our sales are up. And in fact, loads of our clients, I, I did two training sessions last week. I think it was 26 uh, of my clients were there. And every one of them has a strong pipeline. They're advancing sales. I had four or five of them that were closing six-figure deals that had stalled for a couple of weeks. But now they're getting them over the line. I've got uh, one client who doubled her prices in order to try and limit demand. Demand went down 12%, but she's closing over 90% of the opportunities in her pipeline. I had another one who year on year is 3,500% up on April last year. So this is a great opportunity if you are prepared, you're doing the behavior, you have a system for selling, and you're prospecting. If you're, doing, if you're not doing any one of those, or none of them, you're in trouble. And that's on you. I, you know, I, I, I have a lot of sympathy for your panic, um, but you control your behavior. You have to, you can, you can manage behavior. You can coach attitude and you can train skills and technique. And all of this, this, uh, lockdown has given you that opportunity. If you've wasted it, shame on you. Mm-hmm. I mean, do you think uh, a lot of partners be traditional might have on their, when vendors and suppliers quite a lot when it comes to sales, you know, um, are they the ones most most vulnerable? Is there a, a lot of you know you need to take the initiative in this period? Yeah, but they, they they absolutely are. You know, if you if you're like the average MSP, you're going to be a relatively small business where the owner is keeping the business small unintentionally um, or intentionally because it's a lifestyle business and they've created a job where they don't have a boss. Um, but they are, too many uh, partners have been uh, overly dependent on their vendors uh, for providing them with leads, and they're too uh, fixated on being techni- technically strong. And they're not really sales organizations. Uh, I, I don't want to be cruel, but the, you know, people have never in the history of humanity woken up and said, you know what I really want? I want a CRM system or an ERP system or a finance system. Um, yeah, I, I want a router. That, that just doesn't happen. No, they want that stuff for a reason. So you need to understand how to uh, translate what, if, what problems your customers have and identify how technology enables you to help them fix those problems and how you can be really valuable strategically as a partner for your end customer. And this is really where vendors, I think, are very much at fault. Uh, because they've educated partners by providing them with awful, shitty, dreadful collateral like product data sheets. 
which are only of interest to people who can say no or maybe. But the people at the top, when they're confronted with, I don't know, uh, you know, HP's new server or um, Fujitsu's new um, whatever it is, uh, you know, uh, PC, um, they don't care. They want to know, can you help my, me solve my strategic problem? How am I going to prevent the bleed of customers uh, that we're churning? Um, how am I going to uh, meet my uh, commitments to my investors? Um, what am I going to do in order to retain my staff? How am I going to uh, recruit, on board, develop and get the best out of my salespeople? All of this can be supported by IT. But how many uh, partners are actually having those conversations with their own customer versus taking an order or trying to say, well, look, your estate's three years old. It probably needs a bit of a refresh. Um, you know, that, that's not really why, why people buy technology. And technology, 80% of business, uh, 80% of IT purchase decisions are in the hands of the line of business. Yeah. Vendors should be teaching and working with their partners, teaching them how to have broader conversations about the business in marketing, in legal, in operations, in uh, R&D, uh, in uh, product uh, development and product management, uh, in finance. They need to be having business conversations and then translating those business needs into technological solutions. Yeah, it's um, crazy times. I mean, you mentioned Damon Bain and the statistic, 150,000 um, MSP type businesses think they're going to go to the wall. And that's a US stat or is that a global stat? Yeah, that's global. That's global. That's like 600,000 um, MSPs worldwide and 25% will not make it through COVID. Now, that means there are a lot of customers out there who really need support. So yeah. there's a fabulous opportunity. If, if you are uh, in a position to prospect in this economy, uh, which all of you should be, then get out there and ambulance chase. Look for uh, your local competition and cherry pick their best accounts because their best accounts will be nervous um, if their MSP is financially unstable. I know it sounds cruel, but you know, all is fair in love and war and sales. Uh, get out there and hustle. Uh, you know, speak to people about what it is they're concerned about. Uh, think about how their businesses are going to change uh, as a result of uh, the uh, impact of COVID um, and uh, working from home, virtualization. Um, you know, what this will do, I think, is it's going to drive the introduction of 5G uh, even faster. Um, I think what it's also going to do is create a massive impetus around uh, these virtual uh, technologies that allow better collaboration, better interaction, and th th that will also democratize uh, innovation and creativity within businesses um, because you'll be able to draw on more people who aren't faffing around in internal meetings, who aren't traveling, stuck in airports, stuck in the air. You know, that's all dead time to a large mm -hmm. extent. Um, and, you know, now, Instead of being able to see two to three customers a day, you can speak to six to eight. You know, we're, we're seeing a huge increase in our, our tech our clients um, who are increasing their level of touches. Um, and you can speak to recapture accounts, two of those a day. You can speak to existing accounts, two of those a day. You can speak to uh, growth accounts, and I would speak to two to four of them a day. And then... Uh, two to four uh, warm prospects, you know, aim to have a minimum of five to seven unique, effective conversations every day, which means that you actually speak to a human being. You get past whatever gatekeeper there may be. You contract with them that you'll explain the purpose of your call in under 30 seconds. And at the end, they will make a decision. Either yes, they will continue talking for another couple of minutes or no, they'll hang up. And if you hang up or you're at the point of hanging up, ask for referrals. You know, David, I know that we couldn't do business on this occasion. I wonder if you happen to know somebody who fits this kind of profile, who might be struggling with those kind of issues. Um, I would also look at your customers' uh, supply chain. If you think about it, how many of your customers depend on their suppliers? Well, if their suppliers go under, and you, for example, are expert in security. And um, now what's happened is that 
All these organizations have had to work from home, but the security is essentially massively compromised because people are working on domestic laptops, on domestic routers with domestic security. So they've spent years and tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of pounds um, investing in uh, great security. And now it's all being compromised because people are being, uh, you know, leaving the back door open. We know 80% of um, cyber attacks are initiated because of some problem with the wet web. You know, it's yeah. people that create those problems. Now, uh, what we also know is that on average, I think it's 176 days uh, the hacker has been in your system before they trigger the attack. Um, so what we will see is in about five months' time, uh, when we come out of this, there will be a slew of cyber attacks. Now, if that isn't a God-given opportunity to do some audits to find out if you have been penetrated, um, and that's a good, great piece of consultancy, which then results in a follow-on conversation about what else can we do? I mean, why, why are people not doing this? Licking their wounds, you know, praying, at them, you know, praying for the phone to ring, staring at it aggressively, praying it will ring. Now, that's not going to help you. Get out there and do your job. Do you think it's a, um, Sorry, let me make one point. Go on. Let me make one point. This, is, this has really exposed the weakness in sales management in the, uh, in the partners themselves, but also in the channel and in direct sales. Um, managers get less than 5% of the worldwide training budgets invested in them. They are pivotal. They have the most precarious job on the planet. If you're in channel management, you have the hardest and most precarious job there is. Um, and phoning people up and saying, what have you got for me this month, Bob? Nothing great. I'll call you next month. It's just an interruption. They need to be spending 50 to 70% of their time with their partners, coaching, training, and developing them, helping them sell, helping them be successful. And so what I would be uh, recommending is that you look at your partners, you do the, um, the uh, square root of the number in your organization and do the calculation. And almost without exception, you find that the square root of the number generates 50%. Now, this is radical. Cull the bottom 50%. Re redeploy that pipeline to the top 50% of wow. producers. Okay, invest all that money that you've been burning in recruiting, training, developing, and supporting the top 50% and recruit people just like them. Same thing with your partners. Have one partner per region and make them ultra successful and help them grow. And we've got clients where they're growing 300, 500, 1200, 1000, even 4000 percent in a year. Now, if you do that, they're going nowhere else. And if you train them to sell, they will sell your stuff, not your competitions, which is probably what's going through your head. Yeah. Do you, do you think there's um, a bit of fear in the industry, in the industry of uh, the profit of the current situation? Is that is that held people back? Sorry, what do you mean? Well, people don't want to be seen to see profiteering off of uh, you know the global pandemic. You know, I've seen several people sort of almost hold themselves back. You know, it seems to be you know, right. wasting the opportunity okay. of touch. Opportunity of touch. Um, so this moves into the area of sales ethics. Okay, um, it is utterly repugnant and completely unethical to sell something to somebody that they don't need or want. Okay. Now, sometimes you have to challenge whether they want it because they need it. Um, and it's absolutely right that you should not be selling to people who do not need what you uh, can offer them. Okay. But if they have a problem and you can help them solve it, isn't it more morally bankrupt to not have that conversation with them? The problem is that many people don't really value sales. They see it as something grubby and some dark art. So a quick game of word association for the audience. First word that comes to mind when I say pen, bottle, chair, um, ceiling, salesman. Okay. If any of you responded with creepy, pushy, selfish, uh, you know, shiny suit or something like that, you have a self-concept problem and you're struggling conceptually with sales as a profession. Now, what that means is, that you will try not to be one of those snake oil salespeople. But actually what you do is you go the other way and you try and make friends. 
Sales is not a place to get your emotional needs met. It's a place to go to the bank. And you have an ethical responsibility to help your customers and your prospects make it through this period. And yes, it may be the case that you don't need, uh, that the timing is wrong, but you need to have those conversations with them. The, you know, the world hasn't stopped spinning. The global economy has shrunk massively. Yeah. In 2010, the UK economy shrank by two, uh, by 3%. We're looking at 6% just because of COVID. Okay. And, and the, you know, the Bank of England's forecasting 14% because of global depression and Brexit. Okay. So a 14% reduction. These people are panicked. They are in a bad place and they need your help. Get out there and help them. Okay. Do not think for a second that they won't welcome your call because if you do a good call that actually speaks to their business concerns, and engages them, then they will take your call. Um, it was, uh, I think it was CSO Insights two years ago, did a piece of research, and they said 88% of CEOs hate receiving cold calls. In the same survey, 83% of CEOs love receiving good cold calls. There might be a clue in that. bit incongruous. <laughs> yeah, well, make a good call. Actually, yeah. be a decent salesperson instead of some passive patsy order taker who just shows up and throws up and talks about technology, which no one cares about. That's the equivalent of showing photos of your ugly children to strangers and expecting them to coo. <laughs> okay, Mark, we're getting towards the end of, uh, of the show here. I mean, if you can get your paintbrush out and, you know, Design the perfect channel organization that emerge and flourish out of the situation. What, what are you painting there? You build, uh, first of all, look in the mirror and make sure you are a good partner if you're a vendor. Okay. Because many of you are bloody awful. Okay. Uh, you think this is a get out of sales free card. Uh, you, you think that your, vet, uh, your partners care about your products or your services and they spend their lives thinking about it. They don't. They're in business for their reasons, not yours. Okay. Uh, next, make sure that you go through your partner network and you identify the ones who are committed, who are good producers, who have a great sales operation and then work really hard with them and help them sell more, more often for more money to more people. Uh, your, your job, put money in their back. They're coin operated. Now, they're in business for their reasons, so that means you have to spend time with them understanding why they're in business, what they want from the business, how they want to uh, grow, uh, what their values are, uh, and um, what their ideal customers are, and help them be successful. And build a special forces unit, not a land army, okay? And special forces, they spend an awful lot of time in training. Uh, they're constantly being coached. They're constantly being assessed. And as your channel managers, you have to work on them. Your channel managers should not be uh, Tim Nice But Dim, who kind of failed in direct sales and you sent him out to pasture uh, because you think the channel, well, what harm can he do? Um, you don't send them your greenhorn uh, salespeople so that they can cut their teeth because that just pisses off your partners. And um, they, they suffer from channel uh, from uh, vendor fatigue. Yeah, you know, if you've got a dozen partners, the average partner manager lasts 2.1 years. Now, if you've got 12 of those, pretty much every six months, you're getting uh, a new one turning up. And you're just getting worn out with this constant merry-go-round and revolving door. Um, make sure that uh, as a vendor, what you are doing is you are helping your business, your partners get better and vice versa, which means that you need to establish certain ground rules. And one of those ground rules is you will fight. Constructive conflict is a good thing. You need to hold each other to account, agree to that stuff up front. What are the accountability factors that they, your partners will hold you to account for? How will you hold them to account? And equally, take that into the end customer. How are they going to hold you and the partner accountable for deliverables? Is it down to um, understanding their business? Is it communicate ease of communication? Is it responsiveness? Is it um, sticking to cost and time? You know, all of those things. Um, you know, what matters to the end customer? What matters to the partner? What matters to you? 
and create genuine partnerships instead mm-hmm. of this um, ludicrous uh, setup that many of you have got, um, which is that you're in competition with each other. You're aligned uh, direct sales with the channel. But, yeah, I, I was interviewing John Delogier uh, from 8x8, and I interviewed James Legg, uh, the CEO of Phycotic. <coughs> Both of them are absolutely passionate about the channel. And they work with a handful of partners. They don't work with masses of partners. They don't go to trade shows and sign up as many as they can. Um, they work with a tiny, tiny handful and they really aim to make them successful. And if it's not working, then they get involved. Um, you know, John Pelosi is speaking to partners on a regular basis. This is a guy who has global responsibility and he's picking those, he's having daily conversations with partners. Um, you know, this is not something that is done from afar. You have to get your hands dirty, roll up your sleeves and get right into the muck. Yeah. Okay. okay. Look, Marcus, thank you very much for joining me. I've had a great time talking to you. For our audience quickly, you might want to go and uh, you know find out a little bit more about you or on ABC podcasts and stuff. Where where should they go to sort of check out Marcus Gout to? Um, well, you can go to, I have two podcasts. One is Marcus Kauke, M-A-R-C-U-S-C-A-U-C-H-I dot podbean.com. And that's my Inquisitor podcast. And that's broad-based sales channel management. Um, and then I have uh, the uh, scale-ups and hypergrowth dot podbean.com. And that's uh, S-C-A-L-E-U-P-S A-N-D-H-Y-P-E-R-G-R-O-W-T-H dot podbean.com. Um, and you can get those on Spotify and uh, Apple Podcasts. And also um, get hold of making channel sales work at the risk of sounding mildly self-serving, uh, genuinely <laughs> the best book on channel that's ever been written um, because it's been written with the partner front and center. Uh, it's about a partner-centric channel and it's, uh, it's got tools in there uh, to help you uh, help your partners prospect, fill their funnel, disqualify out the time wasters, push stuff through. Um, and I've got a, a YouTube channel and there's a dedicated channel on there. And there's also uh, a LinkedIn group called Making Channel Sales Work. And if you want to contact me, get me on LinkedIn. I'm over it like a rash. Brilliant. Okay. Well, look, thanks again, Marcus. Um, I'm really looking forward to catching up with you again next month or so to see how things are going for you. Marcus will be joining us at Channel Live January. Um, uh, that's in Birmingham. So uh, make sure you get that in the 19th and 20th of January. And uh, not more to say, markets. We'll catch up soon. Thanks for joining me. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.